Good morning. So, good to see you all this morning. Please don't panic. The uh, coronavirus has not aged Matt this drastically. Uh, I'm Rich Fink. I'm Matt's assistant at Redeemer and uh, filling in for him today to give him a little break because he's been working very hard. So, I want to share a couple of readings with you today. One is from uh, St. Peter's second letter. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And then uh, a gospel lesson from John 13. This is at the Last Supper. And Jesus has just washed his uh, his disciples feet and put on his outer garments and he sits down again and he says to them do you understand what I have done to you you call me teacher and lord and you are right so I am if I if I then your lord and teacher have washed your feet you also ought to wash one another's feet for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And that's the gospel. So here we are in, what, fifth week of quarantine? I, I don't know, honestly. I've kind of lost count. What started out as something of a, a lark, uh, uh, an interesting little adventure, is now becoming a burden. And I say that as someone who is retired and who is living with the easiest person in the world to live with and who's not trying to homeschool kids or keep them entertained 24 hours a day. We all are being challenged in ways which we perhaps never expected. Who would have thought two months ago that toilet paper would be at the top of our wish list or that a trip to the grocery store would be the highlight of our week? Last week, Matt mentioned a number of issues that, that you and I are still dealing with. And I'd like to share a text with you that highlights one of the things that's challenging me. And I would suspect many of you as well. This is from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. I love that passage. I've loved it for many years. But to be honest... I have problems reading through it smoothly. Whenever I read it, I get tripped up on that fourth item, patience, like you catch your toe in the edge of a carpet. I've always had trouble with patience. No one who knows me well would describe me as a patient person, and certainly no one who's ever been a passenger in my car. Patience has always been a problem for me, and as this pandemic continues, it's becoming more so. I'm impatient for this to be over. I'm impatient to get back to my normal. I'm impatient feeling like I'm under a house arrest. I'm impatient being told where I can go and where I have to stand when I get there. I'm impatient with politicians who are using this crisis as a political opportunity. I'm impatient, certainly, with people who hoard toilet paper. How about you? You feeling some of that stuff? I'd be kind of surprised if you weren't. And this enforced togetherness that has been imposed upon us with very good reason, no argument, no argument with that, can make us impatient even with the people we care about the most, the people we love, who comprise our family. Minor irritations become major when we don't have other things to distract us, like job responsibilities and, and other things. And dare I say it? I would guess that there are many who are feeling impatient even with God. We are tr tempted to cry out with the lament that people always utter in moments of disaster and crisis, where is God? And that's not even limited to moments of crisis. Whenever we suffer loss, when things don't go our own way, when we pray and we feel like God doesn't answer right away or in exactly the way that we want him to, we get impatient and we want to know, where are you, God? Why aren't you acting in this? Why aren't you hearing what I'm saying and doing what I want? Now the world is in a grip of something we can't even see. We're forced into an unnatural isolation from the world around us, the people we love, and we're impatient for God to step in and stop the virus, virus rescue the sick, 
free us from our homes as he, as he freed the people of Israel from Egypt. Well, that's a little over the top, I guess, but you get the idea. Why, we impatiently ask, doesn't God act according to our time schedule? Why doesn't he see the wisdom of doing what we want? I would guess that most of us, when it's stated in those terms, recognize what is going on here. The root of our impatience is the very essence of sin itself, self-centeredness. Usually our impatience is the result of the person ahead of us at the traffic light not immediately moving forward when the light turns green, or the person in front of us at the grocery store who has 21 items in the 20 items only express lane, or that little blue circle on our computer which takes more than three milliseconds to get us to our website, or even God himself not realizing that what I want I should get when I want it. Why should I get what I want when I want it? Well, it's self-evident, because I'm the most important person in the universe. Of course, we never frame it that way. We never even think of it that way. But that is the consistent lie that the sin within us is constantly whispering in our ears. I recently came across a quote which resonated powerfully for me because it spoke so personally to me. It's from Don Miller's book, Blue Like Jazz. This is it. The most difficult lie I have ever contended with is this. Life is a story about me. Let me say that again. The most difficult lie I have ever contended with is this. Life is a story about me. And whenever I believe that, Life is a story about me. I get impatient with everyone and everything around me, even God. Perhaps that is why St. Paul wrote that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and patience, because these things do not come naturally to us. They have to be created within us by God's Holy Spirit working within us. My default setting is, I admit, to be impatient, to be impatient with anyone and anything that does not acknowledge what the deepest, darkest part of my heart wants me to believe, that life is a story about me. My life, your life, the life of the world, it's all about me. And this moment in which we find ourselves is perfect soil for that kind of thinking to take root in. Now, set against that, we have the picture that the Bible paints for us of God. Like this from Psalm 86:15. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Slow to anger. Did you hear that? Patient. But you know how that reads in the older King, George, King James Version of the Bible? The one written in 1611? It uses a word we never use anymore, but I love it. Instead of slow to anger or patient, it has that wonderful old phrase, long suffering. You see, when you and I read the word patient, it conjures up for us image of not getting into the dentist's office as quickly as we think we should, or waiting for that little blue circle to finish its work. But that's not what the Bible's talking about here. That's not long-suffering. For the Israelites who first read those words, long-suffering conjured up images of a God who withheld his anger for centuries before Noah, while the world was spiraling down into decadence and sin, who rescued his people from Egypt after 430 years and then stayed with them for 40 years in the wilderness, providing for their every need, who didn't wipe them out in anger when he finally brought them to the promised gates of the promised land, and they wouldn't go in because... They didn't trust him. Oh, did not turn his back on his people who betrayed him for hundreds of years at a time, who turned their backs on him, who suffered long their indifference to his love and his care and his will. And who all that time, literally from the time of the Garden of Eden, was carefully and patiently working out his plan to save not only his own people, but a world who hardly knew he existed or cared. 
long-suffering, such a rich word, so much more powerful than patient. That long-suffering of God which re would reach its apex in his son who came specifically to suffer long for us and to die for us. Throughout Jesus' life on earth, he suffered rejection, misunderstanding, and hostility from the very people he came to save. His long suffering would climax in a Roman courtyard where he patiently endured the, the rod, the beatings, the jeers, the spitting, the crown of thorns, the betrayals, the lies, the false accusations, the scourge, and finally the nails and the cross, and even separation from his father to save us from our impatient self-centeredness, our sin and death. And then he lay patiently in the tomb until the third day when his father raised him from dead, forever victorious over sin and death. He offers to all who trust in him forgiveness, eternal life, and peace as a free gift through faith in him. And he waits patiently for all those who will receive his gift. His word tells us why he waits patiently, why he just doesn't wipe out a world which basically ignores him. The Apostle Peter writes, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God wants heaven to be as full as possible, so he waits patiently for his word to work in the hearts of as many people as possible. Patience will continue to be a challenge for us for the foreseeable future. When you are tempted to impatience, remember the patience of our long-suffering, loving Lord. Pray for that fruit of the Spirit, that long-suffering patience. Now don't pray like the man who said, Lord, give me patience, and I want it right now. But pray rather for the Spirit to give you the patience which remembers that all things work together for good to those that love God. Remember Paul's exhortation to the Corinthian and Ephesian churches that love is patient. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. God be with you, give you patience, help you to endure through these moments as we move together through this unusual time. God's blessings. Would you pray with me? Lord God, our heavenly and merciful Father, we thank you for all the blessings with which you fill every day of our lives. We thank you for your patience with us, with your patience with our self-centered impatience. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving your life on the cross so that we might know the promise of forgiveness and eternal life as your free gift to all who believe in you. We pray that you would be with all who are suffering because of this worldwide pandemic. We pray that you would bring an end to it in your perfect time, Father. Heal those who are ill. Let no one else die. Let no one else catch it, Father. Guide those who are working hard and long to find a cure, an antidote, and a vaccine. Be with all those who are working in the front lines, our first responders, our medical professionals, our truck drivers, all the people who are keeping society moving and guard them against disease and danger, Father. Be with us. Give us patience as we live with one another in enforced isolation. Father, help us to show the love to one another that you show to us in your Son, Jesus. And we ask it all in his holy name. Amen. Go in peace. Know the blessing and the love of God and be patient with one another. Amen.